turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7 as we continue our journey through the Old Testament on Sunday evenings. 2 Samuel chapter 7. We've come to probably one of the most important passages, not just in 2 Samuel, but perhaps in the entire Bible. Again, every passage, every verse is important, uh, but uh, what we see in this chapter is uh, absolutely uh, mind-bottling, <coughs> breathtaking, because it's a prophecy about the future uh, lineage of David as well. David, at this point, is at the pinnacle of power. Uh, he's king over all of Israel, as we saw in the previous chapters. His enemies are subdued. Uh, he desires to build a house for God in Jerusalem. Uh, the, he has the ark in his possession. It was made the journey there. Um, in chapter 6, uh, but God's going to inform David through the prophet Nathan that he will not build him a house. Instead, God's going to build David a house, uh, a dynasty establishing the family line as only one authorized to provide that royal leadership for Israel. So with that as a bit of a backdrop, let's dive in. Verse 1. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house that the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around and that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells out inside tents curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, <clears throat> as you can probably journey along uh, with David, he's been dwelling in caves, being on the run for all these years, and now he uh, has a beautiful home that he's living in. And maybe he was sitting out on the balcony, perhaps in the cool of the evening, looking out his beautiful home, and, uh, and then he's looking at the tent where the ark was and uh, dwelling there and perhaps he felt ashamed of this why is he dwelling in this beautiful uh, house but the ark is in this worn out tent and um, area and so it was on his mind so much he tells nathan the prophet that he wants to build god a home for the ark to stay in and someone once remarked that a test of a person's spirituality is seeing what they do in their leisure time uh, and here we see David spending his time with the Lord and spending time with uh, Nathan the prophet, godly man, a counselor, uh, and it's always wise to get, uh, keep uh, good company. Well, Nathan the prophet knew the Lord's hand was upon David and uh, his life and was desiring uh, to build a house for the Lord. Uh, and, and David was just simply expressing his deep love for, for God. And therefore, he thought it certain that the Lord must have inspired these particular thoughts and desires for David to build a house uh, for the Lord to dwell in. And I believe it was Augustine that, uh, who was asked about how do you determine uh, God's will uh, uh, for our life? And he responded, love God with all your heart and then do whatever you want. Because here's the thing, if you're loving God, it's not going to be hard to not find the will of God. He's going to lead you. He's going to uh, put those things directly uh, in your life. And so simply loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, the decisions that we make, uh, he's going to lead us in his plans and purposes. So, so David, fellowshipping with the Lord, considering all the ways that God had blessed him, in all the ways that he could return to the Lord uh, for that goodness that he has done in his life. And perhaps David searching the scriptures uh, during this time and, and during this uh, and doing this, I believe that he realized that the Lord had told the children of Israel eventually that they would settle in the land of promise and that they would need to make a new permanent arrangement for serving the Lord. So originally it was the tabernacle and the tent uh, moving around from place to place. And now eventually they want a, a permanent structure. Now, as we mentioned in uh, <clears throat> previous messages, that the ark, uh, you know, dwelling in a tent was around 400 years or so at this point. So it's just been moving around um, and still in existence perhaps at this point. Uh, and, and now David, it's on his heart to build a house for this to dwell in. Maybe David was uh, remembering what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, verse 10 and 11 says this, When you cross over the Jordan and 
dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit. He'll give you rest from all your enemy all around you and so that you dwell this safely and there will be a place where the Lord your God chooses to make you uh, uh, make his name abide. And when you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and your choice offerings, which you now vow to the Lord. And I think David feels this is the place for building um, the Lord, um, this tabernacle, this uh, temple eventually uh, to, to put up. And so as Nathan the prophet hears this, he encourages David, do what the Lord's put on your heart. Now, this is not um, Nathan speaking as the prophet. He's speaking as a man, as a friend. He's not speaking, thus saith the Lord. He had received no message from the Lord at this uh, time uh, yet. And so he's expressing his personal view uh, that the king was on good and proper idea uh, to go ahead and do this. Uh, and it's based on the advice that was well established that the fact that the Lord was with David. Over and over you see that phraseology, uh, the Lord was with David. And we notice again, however, that the proposal uh, here is vague. It's undefined. It's just, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, it's just, uh, and neither David nor Nathan was pretty clear on precisely what should be done. It was just a thought. Hey, let's, let's, let's do this. Uh, so they just agreed in this present situation uh, that the king in a cedar house, the ark is in a tent, uh, that's less than satisfactory. The Lord should get the best and something should be done. So do what seems best to you, as Nathan says to David. It sounds reasonable. It sounds right. But listen what transpires next. Verse 4. But it happened at the night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David. And, and that's a statement you need to keep in mind because it's a special relationship between God and David. It's also mentioned in verse 8, as we'll see. Go tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Would you build... A house for me to dwell in for I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt even to this day but I've moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel I've ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel but whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying why have you not built me a house of cedar so it's, it's been noted that even the best of human beings uh, with the highest motives often get things wrong because uh, we're, we're fallible, you know, we're, we're not perfect. And, it, and it's especially in our response to God. Frequently it's been, uh, it's because we, we don't properly understand the situation in which we find ourselves oftentimes. David had initiated bringing the ark up from Kareth Jerem, uh, which seemed right and good to do. Uh, we saw this in chapter 6. Uh, however, something went wrong as uh, God eventually intervened and was, uh, that project was delayed. As we know uh, that um, the man held out his hand as the ark was falling and uh, God killed him. And then it was placed for about three months until it was able to be brought uh, properly. Uh, but oftentimes, again, we're, so, uh, we're not able to see as God sees. Again, he sees it all. He knows it all. Uh, and therefore, uh, often incapable by our, by our own abilities to discern the right way. So even though it might be a great idea, is this really what the Lord wants and how he wants to do it? So, and this was the case with David and Nathan. And so their, their concerns about the ark and its tent. And so the Lord tells Nathan, uh, the prophet, to return and tell David uh, to tell him not to build uh, a, a house for the Lord at all. And that's a hard thing, uh, you know, for him to, to hear this. Uh, and, and here we see David, or the Nathan the prophet, had been completely wrong in how he counseled David and go and do what was on his heart to, to build the house. So he would have been di uh, going directly against the Lord if he said, hey, keep doing it, regardless of what the message I just heard from the Lord. So David, as we know, was a man after God's heart. We know from scriptures and that he has been made by um, you know, the Lord to be king over all of God's people. And every person, again, as we know, has their own callings and ministries. Uh, it wasn't the Lord's plan for David to build the house of the Lord. And so thus the Lord tells Nathan, you know, are you the one uh, who should build me a house to dwell in? Now, in our Christian lives, sometimes we have it on our hearts 
that uh, entering some sort of job or ministry or something else and the Lord tells you no. Uh, sometimes it's a timing, not yet. Uh, sometimes it's, no, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go here instead. Uh, I know for me that was the case. I uh, had uh, the timing of coming to Australia completely whacked out. I wanted to go as soon as possible. Uh, in fact, I would be telling everyone else we're leaving. I haven't told my wife yet that we're going to go to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, and I thought we were going to go to Sydney to do a church plant there and do all that. But the Lord said, no, I want you here in Melbourne. Uh, but there's many other times that it's on our heart to go do certain things and the Lord shuts that door down for certain reasons. Um, and so these are sometimes difficult times to deal with because we've sought the Lord, our sincere heart's desires to serve Him, and then we find out He doesn't want to use us in that capacity and the way we desired. That's a tough one for our pride. And this tells me that the best ideas, the godly actions still need to be brought before the Lord uh, to see if they are His will to be done. Even though it seems like the Lord wants it, He's in it, He's opening doors, but He may not want you to go through that particular door. Uh, it's not that the idea is wrong. I think that God is honored by the fact that David wanted to do this uh, to build him a house for the ark to dwell in. And thus God speaks to Nathan and tells him, no, he can't. And notice the response of David. In fact, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, we see this response by David and what he tells the people. He says this in verse 2 and 3. He says, Then King David arose to his, his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house for the rest, for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. He has made uh, preparations to build. But God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. That was his reasoning. Again, we know he's going to uh, have a lot more other problems later on. But at this point in time, this was God's response to him. David was a man of war. His blood was on his hands, and God didn't want David to build him a house, as we'll see. And so God's going to turn the tables on David, though, and tells David that he's going to build him a house. Not on the house that we think, but the house, the lineage. Um, now, I like this because David's not able to build the house, but he can gather the materials together uh, so that when Solomon comes onto the throne, uh, that he can build the house and he will have all the materials that he needs to do it. So that's a wonderful response. If I can't do it, I'm going to help someone else do it. And that takes humility instead of, well, fine, I'm not going to do it anyway. And then he could have had a hissy fit and a temper tantrum, right? Uh, so... And again, in Second Chronicles chapter 29, we're told all the things that uh, uh, David brought uh, and the preparations that were made uh, for him and all the list of items uh, to bless and to help uh, Solomon. And uh, I like how one writer shares their perspective that really sums it up for us. And it gives us kind of the, the correct perspective uh, to have because sometimes when God shuts down a work, we shut down. Uh, we lose motivation and focus, and we shouldn't. Uh, but that's because of our pride, right? So if I can't do it, then no, I'm not going to get involved and help out, you know? And we just kind of go in that way. But he said, you know, if I can't do it, I'm going to support. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do whatever. Um, so one writer explained it this way. He says, if you cannot uh, have what you hoped, don't sit down in despair and allow your energies of your life to run to waste, but arise, gird yourself uh, to help others achieve. If you may not build, you may gather materials uh, for him in that uh, so he, he can. Uh, you may not go down the mine, but you can hold the ropes, end quote. You know, and that's what we'd always tell our missionaries when we sent out. Because not everyone's going to be able to go out, but you can hold the rope. So one missionary holding one end of the rope the other missionary or the, the support team holding the other end you, you need both you can't just go down by yourself so we, we all need to be holding one end of those ropes so maybe remember this and keep moving forward because it's not about us it's about the lord it's about him uh, we are serving him faithfully whatever he calls us to do or not to do okay so if i can't sing i can support uh, uh, the worship team right now what do we do in those times when the Lord tells us no? It's so critical. 
uh, it determines whether or not we will be able to continue to trust the Lord um, and also how effective we'll be uh, for being for the Lord. You know, so it's just it comes down to our hearts and our attitude and our response. Well, we see here, uh, knowing that he, he will not be the one who builds the uh, house for the Lord, uh, but David nonetheless begins tirelessly obtaining the materials, uh, supplies that are needed to complete the house. And so he determines to assist the one later on. So that's the right move to make. How can I, if I can't do it, how can I support? How can I help? And sometimes we find out years down the road why the Lord has led us in certain ways and perhaps said no in regarding prayer or that opportunity. And, and he is a sovereign God. He knows what's best. So why is it important in our lives? You know, because the Lord is in control. He knows what's best for us. Um, and uh, he's going to get glorified no matter what we do. And I believe the Lord honors the desire of our hearts to serve Him in any capacity or any ministry, whether or not we actually end up being called uh, by Him to fulfill that ministry. Just the gift of presence, being showing up, makes a difference um, in, a, in, a, in a church, in a congregation. You know, it, it changes the environment, the atmosphere, the, the faith, uh, the excitement uh, that happens as well. I think David, he will be rewarded uh, when he gets for heaven um, for having built uh, the tabernacle uh, because he's, he, he, it gets attributed to him uh, as well. So A, Solomon was the one that did it, but again, David was a part of that action. He gets the equal rewards. And uh, many believers likewise will receive rewards and ministries that they sought to the Lord concerning, um, but they were told no. You know, and there's, uh, I remember hearing uh, um, a nurse who really wanted to go to China to serve, but she couldn't for various reasons. Uh, and so she ended up supporting dozens of missionaries out there because she couldn't. You know, so she was able to fulfill that calling through others. And uh, just as David here, many times in our life as Christians, it's the case that we uh, sow uh, for the Lord, but someone else will reap uh, that what we have labored for, you know, the, uh, the fruit. So we just got to be faithful, whatever the Lord calls us to do. Um, but it's no big deal to the Lord that he dwelt in tabernacle or a tent instead of a, ta a temple. Um, so the Lord's not impressed by the grandiose displays, you know, how some churches are so... Um, you know, pristine and, you know, that's so lavished, you know, it's more of about the people than the building, you know, and, and again, here we're in a, a school, you know, uh, the, but, but I know that the Lord's pleased because of the people here and our hearts desire to worship him and draw close to him. So um, verse eight goes on to say, now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant, David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from the following the sheep to be ruler of my people over Israel. And I've been with you uh, wherever you've gone, I've cut off your enemies before, uh, from before you, and you have made you, a, uh, made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they will dwell in a place of their own and move no more, and nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previous. And since the time that I've commanded the judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that I, he will make you a house. So the Lord's telling Nathan to remind him of what God had done for David. Uh, God had called David uh, when he was a boy watching the sheep, as you remember. Uh, he cut off all his enemies, made David a great man. Uh, Nathan is reminding David to tell uh, him all the things that God had done. And it's good to have these reminders. Uh, David had that shepherd's heart. Uh, for God's people, and God tells him that he's gonna that the people will be safe, uh, and this is what the shepherd would have wanted to hear. Also, God was going to make David a house, an everlasting dynasty that would uh, come forth from David. And I like what the Lord does here because <clears throat> He reminds him uh, how He brought him thus far, how He's protected him. 
watched over him, uh, made his name great, and thus don't let this stop you from going forward. Um, you know, don't let this go to your head as well. Um, and so God's uh, telling David that he can't do it, but the Lord's going to build him a house. And um, and we're going to see as that continues on in verse twelve. <clears throat> when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, and you shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took him from Saul, and whom I removed from you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever, according to all the words and according to the vision. So Nathan spoke to David. So here we see the Lord telling David through the prophet Nathan that he's going to build him a house. And what does it speak of? So one, it's going to be through his line. Uh, so the, the near fulfillment will be that, but the end fulfillment is through Jesus Christ. This is the uh, promise of the coming Messiah through the line of David, uh, the tribe of uh, uh, Judah, uh, ultimately. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, Peter comments on this fact that David realized from his lineage, from his descendants, that the Messiah would come and sit on the throne of David. Um, and so... As you see there in verse 14, uh, that this will be the father, he shall be my son. If uh, he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So if this is speaking of the Messiah, though, and I believe it is, how can he be committing iniquity? Again, he cannot sin, but because he's taken upon our sin uh, as if it's his own. Um, and... Um, and one writer uh, gives this interesting translation, says, When guilt is laid upon him, I will chasten him with the rod of men. And we see how he is beat and how he is whipped. Uh, and, and that's exactly what the, the Lord is saying here. And God says, When guilt is laid upon him, I am going to be his father. He'll be my son. So you can see how that is a, a picture of the Lord here. Uh, it's a unique relationship between God the Father and God the Son. You know, we're not going to really fully grasp it uh, in our finite minds. But if he committed iniquity, uh, that is, when iniquity was laid upon him, when your sin, my sin, was put upon him, uh, it is by his stripes we are healed. He died on the cross for you and for me. He was delivered from our offenses. And the reason he died on the cross, as 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says, who himself bore our sins on his own body on the tree, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by those whose stripes you are healed. And as the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, uh, he says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief. Uh, and we also see uh, later on in uh, chapter uh, 53, he says, He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, esteemed him, uh, stricken, smitten by the Lord, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of his all. So by his stripes we are healed. Um, uh, healed of what? Healed of sin. Sin is that awful disease that afflicts every single uh, one of us uh, upon the face of the earth. And that's why God says in verse 14, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. And thus, I believe Jesus will sit on the, the throne of David uh, forever and will take this suffering uh, for the iniquity. One more point here um, that I like to deal with, and that's the idea of a covenant. Uh, because covenant is being established here with David. The word covenant literally means to cut. And there's two different types of covenant that you see in Scripture. First is kind of this uh, uh, unilateral covenant, which is unconditional, one-party uh, kind of covenant. Uh, it would be like um, uh, what you're going to receive, not based on your actions. So it has nothing to do with you. It has all to do with uh, the covenant maker, which is the Lord. The second type is the bilateral covenant, uh, which is the two-party covenant. So you fulfill your part of the agreement, and then I will fulfill my part of the agreement. So this is conditional covenant. 
Um, let me give you a couple examples that we see throughout Scripture uh, and, and give us an idea where they fall. The first covenant we're introduced in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 is the Edenic covenant. Uh, so this was a kind of a bilateral or conditional covenant given to Adam. Uh, he was to populate the earth, as you remember, to subdue it, uh, to have dominion over the animals, to care for it all, uh, but not to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that was the conditional part, and if they did, they would die, right? Later on in Genesis chapter 12, we have the uh, Abrahamic covenant, and also in chapter 15. So this was unilateral or unconditional covenant uh, given to Abraham based on God's faithfulness, not man's. So God was to make Abraham and his descendants a great nation, and they would be a blessing to all who respect them. And so God was going to give them the land of Canaan. So it was uh, uh, unconditional. It was based on the Lord. In chapter 20 of Exodus, we are given the uh, Mosaic Covenant. Uh, so this was bilateral covenant or conditional based on man's obedience uh, to God's commands. If you're obedient, you'll be blessed. If you're not obedient, you'll be cursed. Right? And you see that all throughout uh, the Old Testament there. And then we see here the Davidic Covenant in uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 4 through 17. And this was an unconditional, uh, based upon God's faithfulness, not upon man. And through this, the Messiah would come and sit on the throne of David and would be an everlasting dominion. And then as we, when we celebrate communion, we're reminded of the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we're told of this new covenant. So this is not a conditional covenant. It's not based on man's faithfulness, but God's. Uh, and so thus this covenant is cut with the blood of Christ and is given to us. And so man has tried to make it a bilateral covenant by putting us under the law, uh, but God came to set us free from the law. And so the law puts us under bondage where grace sets us free. And uh, this is what God has done for us. Now, the remainder of this chapter is a prayer. Uh, we see this as uh, David's thanksgiving to God. So it's really a response to what was just said to David, uh, that promise of the line, uh, the, the predictions there. Verse 18 goes on to say, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and says, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And so this, yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, and you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this a manner of men, O Lord God? So David is humbled by all this. Uh, David is contemplating how God has taken him from being a nobody and raising him up to be king. Also, uh, David contemplated how he went from being a nobody uh, to be the person in whom the Messiah would come. I mean, that's just overwhelming just to think through that. The point is that David uh, gives God credit for uh, everything, you know, and uh, he shows gratitude uh, to the one that has lifted him up. Uh, and, and so we can do a whole message on gratitude here and the importance of gratitude being thankful uh, giving god the credit for the victories of our lives uh, and for no other reason it's a reminder that we serve god and we live for him but we're also going to see that a pattern in this prayer where david repeats back a promise back to the lord uh, that was made to him so he he doesn't do this as if god can forget uh, and I believe God enjoys it when we repeat back his promises because you're claiming the promises in these proclamations. Uh, repeating God's promises reminds us of what God will do. Uh, and it keeps the promise fresh in our mind. And notice that uh, three times in these couple verses, the term, O Lord God, or uh, as another translation for those who would have a, an NIV translation, it says sovereign Lord is used. So that's the idea behind here. And without getting into theological details, it simply means God does what he wants to do. He's in control. Uh, nothing's too hard for him. He knows what's best. And so David reminds himself, and, and, and us for that matter, the fact that, uh, and, and given that God, or David is in awe, that God even chose him for this plan. And when we stand back and we um, look at the goodness of God in our lives, the miracle uh, of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, we're in awe of God. 
you know. And uh, every now and then, I think we need to be in awe of how God has picked us. You know, uh, it's dumbfounding how, how that even comes to being, but he did, and he did it before the foundation of the world, which is even more uh, awe-inspiring. Uh, the double-sided coin of salvation is that from our perspective, we freely choose to follow him, but yet he's already picked us, you know, and that's just the wise choice for us. From God's perspective, God knows all things. He picked us in advance, and uh, as God cannot learn, it, it came no surprise uh, to him. And therefore, we have to accept the fact that God did pick us out of his sovereign will. For that alone, again, um, we can see how David is grateful. Uh, anything else we get in his life is just a bonus. And I found for all who follow God or are willing to be bold in their lives, um, you know, and living for the Lord, again, everything's just a bonus. Just we're, we're blessed is how we typically say. You know, we, we don't deserve it, uh, but we're blessed. We're loved. Verse 20 goes on to say, now, when, uh, what, now what more can David say to you? For you, O Lord, are, no, your servant, for your word's sake, according to your own heart, you have done these things uh, to make your servant know them. So verse 20, again, basically David is speechless. This is David uh, who wrote chunks of the Psalms, uh, and speechless doesn't last very long with David, uh, more to say in this chapter. Uh, the point is that David is awestruck by God's unmerited favor toward him. Uh, and the point where he couldn't think of anything more to say than just to say thank you. Sometimes that's all we got to say. But we're so overwhelmed. Thank you, Lord. And notice the phrase, for your word's sake. So David had some sort of vague concept of uh, the Messiah that would come one day, uh, even without uh, uh, th this prediction. You know, he knew uh, the coming Messiah will happen. Uh, the predictions, as we remember, back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 15, is where the gospel is first mentioned. Uh, that's where the Jesus uh, is prophesied there. Uh, Jacob, uh, that uh, someone from the tribe of Judah, uh, would be the Messiah. And so David would be of that tribe. Uh, and one of the great honors uh, that uh, one could have in the Old Testament was to have God's will revealed to them. And when you study those who are greatly loved, uh, of God, be it Abraham, Daniel, David, they got the privilege of knowing God's will. As Christians, again, today, we are the benefic uh, beneficiaries of these uh, recipients of these predictions. We have everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the complete Word of God. You know, how blessed we are, where back at that time they didn't have everything that uh, uh, we have today. And so uh, David understood that he was just a, a piece of the, the big puzzle uh, that's being put together throughout time. And again, remember, the Bible is written over a huge span of time, over 15, almost 1,600 years. Uh, and as readers, we have the advantage of hindsight of seeing uh, the Bible as a whole, you know, how blessed uh, we are. We, I believe we're living the greatest uh, time in history, you know, and... Um, Verse 22 goes on to say, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, uh, for there is none any uh, God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Um, and who is like your God, like Israel, who the nation of the whole earth, God went to redeem for himself a people, to make himself a name, to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people in whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. So after David told all these wonderful things that's going to happen to him and his descendants, um, he doesn't go on, it doesn't go to his head here. Uh, he realized that he, he's the same David, uh, and the reality is uh, and was that God is greater. Uh, David saw his own life as well as the, the life of the nation of Israel. It's a gift from God um, that we see. Now, the question that you just noticed there or uh, would come up that people would have is, uh, why did God choose Israel? 
uh, of all the nations around the world why did he choose them well again it's obviously his sovereign will um, but he calls them my special people god wanted a group of people <clears throat> to be his representatives to the world he wanted them to tell the world about him to be his witnesses to the world in exchange for that being god's chosen people the israelites uh, have a number of uh, unconditional promises made to them and among these promises in the land of israel belong uh, to them um, forever period you know so it's their land it's god's people it's not the palestinians it's not any other group of people it's the uh, the land of uh, god's chosen people and so <clears throat> they get this privilege of being god's uh, you know um uh, and, and also how the Lord would bring the Messiah uh, um, through the land of Israel. With that said, I believe that David got it. Uh, he got the big picture. He understood. Uh, he understood that God picked the Israelites for a special people. Uh, and and, and in kind of in a dramatic fashion, he took them out of the nation of Egypt uh, into the promised land. David understood that specific descendant of the nation of Israel through David would be the Messiah. And so this paragraph is David just thanking God for that promise. Uh, this prayer is not just so David could thank him for those promises, but it's also to remind us of those promises as well. God makes unconditional promises all throughout the Bible, as we see. Uh, he gives us an unconditional promise if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus that we'll be in heaven. We have eternal life. We have the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and if we can't trust in the promise uh, made to the nation of Israel, how can we trust in the promise he made through Jesus as well? So his, his promises are true. Uh, verse 25 goes on to say, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning this house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel and the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel has revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now you, O Lord, Oh, Lord God, uh, you are God and your words are true. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant and it may continue before you forever. For you, O oh Lord God, have spoken it and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. So David's, you know, concluding this prayer of, of gratitude with this kind of bold command. He ordered God to keep it forever, uh, the promise that he made about his servant, the promise made to build him a house, this dynasty for David. And not only that, but uh, David is asking God to bless his house uh, of his servant, uh, and that I might continue on forever in his sight. So David's courage to make this kind of uh, bold request rested squarely on the word of God. Uh, David knew that God's words were trustworthy. And since God had revealed that he would build him a house that would last forever, as we saw in verse 16, the king found the courage to make these requests. So David's prayer, prayer is basically, Lord, I know you have promised me uh, and, and I will trust you to fulfill it uh, and be faithful to your word. So he's just, you know, I'm going to trust you, Lord. You are faithful. May we also feel the same with the Lord has promised each and every one of us. Um, that he's more than able to bring to pass into our lives, and he's faithful to uh, his word. I like what C.H. Spurgeon, some of you know C.H. Spurgeon uh, in the 1800s, uh, pastored the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle in the UK, and he has this uh, illustration or this uh, point that he makes. He says this, God sent the promises on purpose to be used. If I see the Bank of England note, uh, a promise of a certain amount of money, and I take and use it, uh, but, oh, my friend, uh, do try to use God's promises. Uh, nothing pleases God better than seeing his promises put into circulation. He loves to see his children bring them up to him and say, Lord, do as you have said. Uh, let me tell you, it glorifies God to use his promises, end quote. And that's so cool to see, you know, and the, the promises, the, the plans of what he tells us to do. A heart given over to God is a heart filled with praise and prayer unto God. And that's exactly what we see here with David. Um, 
You see, as we have the Word of God, we have His truth in our hands, in our hearts, in our minds, uh, and we can rest in the promises, we can trust in the promises that He's given to us, just as He did with David. And um, and it's a beautiful picture that we see here. Uh, David comes, he sits before the Lord, he dwells in all the goodness of God and His grace that is shown to him, and you see this magnificent prayer to the Lord. Uh, and it's interesting that it says here that David came and sat before the Lord at the tabernacle and prayed. Uh, someone pointed out that uh, this is the only place in Scripture where anyone prays sitting down. So there's different postures of prayer. This is one of those uh, places that you see someone sitting down. Uh, you know, as long as you're, you're praying is the important thing versus the position that you're in. You're laying down on one side or you're standing, walking, whatever. Uh, but it's just the importance of praying. So David is sitting before the Lord, and he is in awe of the goodness and the grace of God that he has received. And to think that the Lord would build him this house, this kingly dynasty that will last for eternity, is overwhelming to David, especially after the Lord had reminded David uh, of where uh, and what the Lord had called him uh, and the, the, the chosen people. And it would be good for us as believers uh, to uh, every once in a while sit before the Lord uh, and contemplate all the goodness and the grace of God that He has poured out in our life as well. You know, don't just rush through it, but just sit before Him. Um, you know, He's done exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so we see uh, just how David respond when the Lord said no to him. And uh, he didn't, you know, have a temper tantrum and, um, you know, but he responded as a servant. Um, he didn't just sit around and sulk, but instead he got busy. He began to support the work uh, that someone else would do in building the house for the Lord. And uh, in these sort of situations, may we commit ourselves to serving the Lord with all our heart and where we're at in that place where he currently has us. You know, and so uh, we just need to be faithful what he's called each and every one of us to do. Um, you know, uh, so we all have our gifts and abilities to be used by him. Uh, know in your hearts today that the Lord may not have opened a door to serve him the way you had hoped or the way you had thought uh, or prayed for. But nonetheless, the Lord is pleased with you for having that desire as well. And again, his timing's always perfect. The way he leads us, the way he guides us and directs us. Uh, and always keep in mind that God is sovereign. Uh, he knows what's best for our lives. And so we need to trust him and surrender to him in all things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening and this time that we got to sit before you and to read and study your word and how you minister to all of our hearts in different ways and uh, all the situations that we're all facing. Uh, we thank you that you have chosen us. We don't know why you picked us, but you did. Uh, you have blessed us with uh, spiritual blessings and giftings and talents, and uh, your word is filled with promises that we can claim uh, as our own. Help us, not for uh, the sake of our goodness, but only because you promised that you would. And so we thank you um, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for the forgiveness of sins. We are so grateful. We even have the Word of God. We're so grateful that we have a relationship with you. I pray that you fill each and every one of us with your Spirit, that you continue to lead us, guide us, direct us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.